Bonjour et bienvenue dans Rubis sur canapé, le podcast dédié à la joaillerie. Ce mois-ci, et pour la première fois, Rubis sur canapé a un invité anglophone. Il s'agit de Jean-Noël Sony, le célèbre tailleur de pierre. Pour commencer cette émission, nous allons donc nous pencher sur le métier de lapidaire et sur les différentes tailles de pierre. Le lapidaire est celui qui taille les pierres fines et précieuses, à l'exception du diamant en raison de sa dureté très élevée, qui lui est taillé par le diamantaire. Le glypticien, qui pratique l'art de la glyptique, grave sur les pierres. Lorsque c'est en relief, on appelle cela des camées et en creux des intailles. Le travail du lapidaire consiste à tailler la pierre en conservant le maximum de carats, c'est-à-dire de poids, tout en éliminant les inclusions et les défauts, et en lui apportant le plus possible de lumière. Ainsi, le lapidaire doit s'adapter à chaque pierre, sa réfringence, donc la propriété de la gemme à réfracter la lumière, sa nature, sa forme et sa qualité à l'état brut vont le guider pour faire ses choix de taille. Les pierres sont taillées soit en taille fastée, soit en cabochon. La taille à facettes est principalement utilisée pour les pierres transparentes, car elle consiste à renvoyer la lumière de la pierre par un jeu de facettes aux proportions et aux angles précis. Pour réussir à correctement tailler une pierre de cette manière, le lapidaire doit être extrêmement précis, mais également très patient, car cela demande de nombreuses heures de travail. La taille à facettes ronde est la taille de pierre la plus connue. Les pierres opaques sont en général taillées en cabochon, qui est de forme bombée avec une surface plane, le plus souvent ovale. Les différentes étapes de travail de lapidaire sont le sillage, le débrutage, la mise en forme, la taille et le polissage. Le sillage permet de découper la pierre brute à l'aide de disques. Le lapidaire choisit l'orientation de la table, donc la table correspond à la partie supérieure plane dans une taille fastée et élimine les défauts, les fractures et les inclusions. En effet, les inclusions déprécient la valeur d'une pierre, sauf dans certains cas exceptionnels. Par exemple, si l'inclusion représente une raquette de tennis, un amateur de ce sport sera sûrement prêt à payer plus cher pour posséder cette pierre qui sera spéciale pour lui. L'opération préliminaire à la taille est le débrutage, qui consiste à former le feuilletis, qui correspond à la ceinture de la pierre, et à préparer la culasse, qui est la partie inférieure festée. Le polissage se fait sur des plateaux et des mules enduits d'oxyde d'étain. Les tailles de pierre les plus connues sont tout d'abord la taille brillant rond, qui est la forme incontournable du diamant. Les pierres de couleur sont également taillées de cette manière, mais souvent en petite dimension, c'est ce qu'on appelle les pierres de pavage. La forme ovale est la taille la plus répandue pour les pierres de couleur. La taille émeraude est également très courante, Notamment pour les émeraudes, elle a la forme d'un rectangle. La taille poire, en forme de poire, est souvent utilisée pour réaliser des colliers ou des pendentifs. Il existe de nombreuses autres tailles de pierre originales, comme la taille cœur, ou comme son nom l'indique, la pierre est taillée en forme de cœur. Hello jean Noël. I am glad to welcome you in my podcast Ruby sur canapé. Mm, glad to be here. Uh, your name is Jean Noël Sony, and you are an American gem cutter. Yes. First of all, can you explain to us how you entered in the jewelry world, how you started to work as a lapidary? Um, it's a deep question. It was a lot of different, uh, a lot of different steps in multiple different directions. But uh, originally, my mother was of great influence on me as she collected antique jewelry. And she, I would I remember being younger, four or five, six, hanging out in jewelry stores on the floor while she was shopping, playing with stones or whatever. So that's whatever. why you like it? Uh... Yeah, I always grew up around it. Um, the, the business side is, like we were talking earlier, just it, it grew naturally over, over the years, just participating, um, trying to buy stones, finally trying to sell stones. A few years of this, it, it evolves and morphs, and here we are. Okay, that's life. That's life, yeah. Okay. Yeah, you just do participate in it. And um, what is your background? What, what did you do before? Uh, a whole lot of different things. Um, I guess my first job was working in tattoo shops. I was doing body piercing. Um, when I, to apprentice for apprenticeship for body piercing, uh, I was 
making body jewelry for about two years. Mm -hmm. This was before you can order it. Nobody was selling it commercially, so okay. we would manufacture our own, you know, barbells and rings. And um, for two years, I was literally in a machine shop, and uh, it got my interest in machining. Mm -hmm. So uh, with gem cutting, for me, it's it's more of a machining than than an art, mm -hmm. and that's why I really enjoy it. Ah. So. You don't consider it uh, as an art? No. Okay. I think that the stone should look nice anyway. Mm. Okay. You know, so they should be artistic because it's a gemstone. <laughs> it's like looking at an eclair and going, oh, there's cream in there. That's nice. <laughs> <laughs> there's supposed to be cream in there. <laughs> so you're more interested about the technical part than the artistic one? Oh, yes. Yeah, for sure. Um, I don't think of it as an art. Okay. It, it, they just finish, like I try to finish it well. And that's all technical. Mm -hmm. so. Ah, okay. And um, can you explain to us what is it to be a, a gem cutter? What, what is your daily life? It's uh, it's twenty four seven, twenty four hours, seven days a week. Um, you know, oh. when I deal with Nigerians, when it's nine o'clock in the morning for me, it's seven o'clock in the morning for them. When they find stones, sometimes mm. it's three o'clock in the morning for me. Okay. I get a message on my WhatsApp. If I don't answer, it sells to somebody else. Okay. Uh, so there's that. There's, uh, it's just nonstop. It's, the production of things, too, is not on a regular basis. So, you know, people ask me sometimes, you know, um, where do you buy your rough? It depends on where production is and how much production there is. You know, maybe if I buy rough from two, uh, a certain amount of guys in Nigeria that are dealing with sapphires because the sapphire mine is within an eight-hour drive of them, Okay. And then it depletes. There's no more. Maybe I'd never talk to them again because they, they, they don't get other stones that I'm interested in. Mm. So my contacts are constantly changing and evolving and changing and evolving. Um, it's rare that I deal with the same people over years as far as buying goes. And it's the same with selling, actually. Okay. Um, what are the different steps to cut a stone? For me, uh, for everybody, I guess, uh, everybody has their own techniques. Okay. Um, I like to preform the stone. And me meaning that uh, I'll try to remove things that need to go. And then after, I do this by hand. Um, after this... You, what do you mean doing by hands? You don't have a machine? I hold the stone by my hands and okay. I grind it on the, the wheel and get the okay. shape that way. And uh, the basic shape. Uh, after that, I dop it. I attach it with wax to a quill. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I start fastening. The machine helps you repeat angles and sides of the stone indexes. Um, pressure, hand pressure, depth of the cut, and the final polish is all done by eye and okay. technique. Uh, how do you find the good way to cut a stone? You do it a thousand times. Okay. Just practice. Just do it. Okay. <laughs> and uh, about buying, how do you buy stones? In which country? How is it going? It's different everywhere. Um, you know, I, some stones I get in Nigeria, I'll go there. Um, when, when I'm there, things will happen like uh, when you land, phone calls go out and dealers will drive to your area. You know, I've had men drive eight hours to show me stuff I don't want. So you have to tell them, no, I'm sorry, I don't want to buy this. Um, and then sometimes we'll go on the road and we'll drive 10 hours and we'll stop in a village. Uh, you know, we stop in a village, the, the man sits us down a uh, wife pops out of the kitchen and gives us meals. And we sit there for a few hours waiting for them to bring stones from nearby. And we look at them. Sometimes I'll make arrangements with people that are traveling to the, the U.S. for shows like in Vegas or something. And we'll meet in L.A. They'll bring stones from Madagascar via Sri Lanka and Thailand to Madagascar to the U.S. It depends. Yeah. It depends. Sometimes I meet an old hippie in San Francisco and he's got some stones that he bought 20 years ago. Sometimes people write me emails and say they have stones, you know. But more, more now is my reputation is bringing people to me in recent times, but I still have to actively, actively keep up on new contacts. This is my, this is my business. Yes. The stone cutting is my, my passion. Mm -hmm. The buying is my business. And I just, this is what I'm stressed about. This is what I obsess about. This is what I calculate about um, is the buying. Okay, and, and for transport, how does it work to transport the stones? It depends on the country. Um, some countries have, uh, you know, procedure in place. Mm -hmm. uh, some don't. So it just depends. It's um, hard or it's okay? It depends on the country. 
Okay, sometimes yeah. I carry it on me. Sometimes I'll ship things out of the country via FedEx. Uh, right. Yeah. Sometimes uh, I'll pay a smuggler to take it out of the country and ship it from another country. Wow. Um, a story I'll tell you is Tanzania just froze exports out of for gems. Why? Because the new president has been replacing all the government jobs with his family, and these people are trying to uh, exploit profit, so they froze all export. I have this is thousands of dealers were screwed. I have one dealer that went to Africa just before this happened. He spent one hundred eighty thousand dollars on goods, eight hundred kilos of rock. Wow. And uh, in Tanzania, you have to have it sealed by the government, and then they ship it out. They sealed it, but then they froze export. So now his stuff was in control of the government without being able to move. He had to go to Tanzania. He paid government officers a bribe to get his stones. He unpacked them. He put 800 kilos into potato sacks, put the potato sacks on a bus with nuns, and brought it to Kenya, and then got it out from Kenya. Wow. So uh, what I thought, thought was interesting, what I, yeah, it was crazy. What I found interesting was that what he paid for it, the smugglers, and he told me he paid a dollar a kilo to get the stones from Tanzania to Kenya, which is pretty cheap. So and it's pretty, pretty brazen, but uh, it's really amazing. That just happened maybe a few months ago. It's amazing when you have the stone. I say, okay, such a long way to come here. And that's the thing, yeah. It's the, yeah, you never know, you know. And it, they're all they're all millions of years old. Huh? It's not just our lives that are handling it, you know. So it's uh, it's pretty in, it's intense that way. Wow. And uh, so now, what are your projects for the future? Um, I have some secret ones, but uh, you know, I I always try to push myself. Um, Proactively with my own business, every year I mindfully make a step to increase value. You know, and it's scary sometimes because you don't know if people are going to buy or, but it, it's been working out, so it's okay. Um, but yeah, I try to increase value of what I'm working on. It's only me working, mm -hmm. so I I cannot, I can't do more. So I have to be mindful about my time spent. If it's not secret, do you would like to have like an apprentice or to teach someone to do what you do? Um, you know, I have a, maybe if anything, my son, maybe, mm -hmm. um, but ideally in my mind, my brand will die with me kind of thing. Okay. You know, I look at companies like, you know, I don't want to talk sh too much shit, but I look at companies like Tiffany's or something. It's not the, what it used to be. It's a bunch of other people running the name. So I mm -hmm. never want that to happen to me. I never want that to happen. So teaching somebody else, I feel like it dilutes what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it, I really like the idea, like with this exhibit we just saw, you know, the, his work lasted his lifetime and that was it. So okay. I, I like that idea. I like that idea. <laughs> <laughs> you know? hey, and what advice could you give to students who would like to do the same job as you? Um, do what you enjoy and wait for it to attract people that also like it instead of bending your, your own rules to accommodate somebody who's paying you. Mm -hmm. Um, just take the time and, and cultivate your own business with the way you like it. Because it, it is possible to do it and we have the means now with all the internet and the phones and the communication. It's possible to, to make a good business with people that you actually like doing business with. So um, we have this old idea that you need to have somebody else pay you for your livelihood and it's, the, I keep saying this over and over again, but the fact remains that your salary is a, a percentage of the true value you bring to the person you're working for. So. You can make that full value for yourself if you try in that direction. Okay, great. Thank you very much for this beautiful uh, interview. And uh, I wish you a nice journey to come back to San Francisco. Man, I will come back anytime. You go. welcome to California anytime, great. both of you. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Merci beaucoup d'avoir suivi cet épisode. Si vous aimez Ruby sur canapé, n'hésitez pas à aller sur iTunes, lui attribuer des petites étoiles. Cela est essentiel pour le développement du podcast, car ça l'aidera à être mieux référencé, donc plus connu et écouté. Vous pouvez également partager cet épisode sur les différents réseaux sociaux. A très bientôt dans Ruby sur canapé